William R. Hine was a resident of Colesville, Broome County, New York. In a sworn affidavit, he gave his statements and recollections about Mormon prophet Joseph Smith and his family in New York. He said, I was born February 11, 1803, at Colesville, Windsor Township, Broome County, New York. Joe Smith, who became the Mormon prophet, and his father came from Palmyra, or Manchester, New York, and dug for salt two summers, near and in sight of my house. The old settlers used to buy salt from an Indian squaw, who often promised to tell the whites where the salt spring was, but she never did. Joe Smith claimed to be a seer. He had a very clear stone about the size and shape of a duck's egg, and claimed that he could see lost or hidden things through it. He said he saw Captain Kidd sailing on the Susquehanna River during a freshet, and that he buried two pots of gold and silver. He claimed he saw writing cut on the rocks in an unknown language, telling where Kidd buried it, and he translated it through his peep stone. I have had it many times and could see in it whatever I imagined. Joe claimed it was found in digging a well in Palmyra, New York. He said he borrowed it. He claimed to receive revelations from the Lord through prayer, and would pray with his men, mornings and at other times. His father told me he was fifteen years old. I called him half-witted. He was miserably clad, coarse and awkward. He had men who did the digging, and they and others would take interests. Some would lose faith and others would take their places. They dug one well thirty feet deep and another seventy-five, at the foot and south side of the Aquaga Mountain, but found no salt. My nephew now owns the land he dug on. Isis Stowell furnished the means for Joe to dig for silver ore, on Monument Hill. He dug over one year without success. Joe dug next for kids' money, on the west bank of the Susquehanna, half a mile from the river, and three miles from his salt wells. He dug for a cannon the Indians had buried, until driven away by the owner of the land. He dug for many things in many parties. I never knew him to find anything of value. He and his workmen lived in a shanty while digging for salt. When it rained hard, my wife has often made beds for them on the floor in our house. Joe became known all over New York and Pennsylvania. Sometimes his brothers were with him. Isaac Hale, a good Methodist, lived seven miles below me on the river. I often stopped with him when rafting. I have attended many prayer meetings at his house, evenings. Emma was fine-looking, smart, a good singer, and she often got the power. Joe stole his wife, Sunday, while Hale was at church. My wife and I saw him on an old horse, with Emma on behind, as they passed our house on their way to Bainbridge, New York, where they were married. Joe and his father were all the time telling of hidden things, lead, silver and gold mines, which he could see. I called him Peeker. About the spring of 1828, Joe came in front of my house where several men were pitching quoits. I said, Peeker, what have you found? He said he had found some metal plates which would be of great use to the world. He had them in a box and a handkerchief which he carried in one hand. I said, let me see them. Joe Smith said they must first be sent to Philadelphia to be translated. He said the only man in the world who could translate them lived there. After they were translated the world could see them. Calvin Smith, whose farm joined mine, said with an oath, he would see them. Joe said if he laid his hands on him, he would prosecute him. I told Calvin he better not. Since I have seen the conduct of the Mormons, I have many times regretted that I interfered. Citizens wrote to parties in Philadelphia, where Joe said he had sent the plates, and word was returned they had not received them. Joe said they could not be translated in Philadelphia, and they had been sent to New York City. Justice N.K. Nobles wrote to New York and could learn nothing about them. Soon I learned that Joe claimed to be translating the plates in Badger's Tavern, in Colesville, three miles from my house. I went there and saw Joe Smith sit by a table and put a handkerchief to his forehead and peek into his hat and call out a word to Cowdery, who sat at the same table and wrote it down. Several persons sat near the same table and there was no curtain between them. Martin Harris introduced himself to me and said they were going to bring the world from darkness into light. Martin's wife cooked for them, and one day while they were at dinner, she put 116 pages, the first part they had translated, in her dress bosom and went out. They soon missed the 116 pages and followed her into the road and demanded them of her. She refused and said if it was the Lord's work, you can translate them again, and I will follow you to the ends of the earth. Dr. Seymour came along and she gave them to him to read and told him not to let them go. Dr. Seymour lived one and a half miles from me. He read most of it to me when my daughter Irene was born. He read them to his patients about the country. It was a description of the mounds about the country and similar to the Book of Mormon. I doubt if the 116 pages were included in the Book of Mormon. After I came to Kirtland, in conversation with Martin Harris, he has many times admitted to me that this statement about his wife and the 116 pages, as above stated, is true. I heard a man say, who was a neighbor to the Mormon Smith family, in Palmyra, New York, that they were thieves, indolent, the lowest and meanest family he ever saw or heard of. Hiram was the best of the family. Many letters were received from Palmyra, stating the bad character of the Smiths. Calvin Smith and I, while burning brush, found a hole, which when cleaned out, was fifteen feet deep, 
He was covered with poles which had been split with tomahawks. A tree nearby was marked each side for seventy feet. Gun barrels and various Indian implements were found later nearby. The hole was within twenty rods of Joe's salt digging. Newell Knight, who lived a few miles from me, was brought before Justice N.K. Nobles as a witness for reporting Prophet Joe Smith had cast three devils out of him. Knight testified the first was as large as a woodchuck, the second was as large as a squirrel, the third about the size of a rat. Noble inquired what became of them. Knight said that they went out of the chimney. Joe was discharged. Noble told me later that it made his heartache to hear the puppy swear. This occurred during the pretended translation of the plates. I met Prophet Joe's father on the dock at Fairport, Ohio, in July, 1831. He inquired if I came on in the Mormon faith, I replied that I did. A crowd soon gathered about us. One of them asked what my faith was. I said the Mormons were the damnedest set of liars and scoundrels I ever knew. My reply caused a shout from many on the dock. We all took a drink. I rented Claudia Stannard's farm in Stone Quarry, two miles south of the temple in Kirtland. Before I rented the quarry, a combination had been formed not to let the Mormons have any stone. I quarried and sold the Mormons the stone used in the construction of the temple, except a few of the large ones, which came from Russell's quarry. Prophet Joe and his father frequently talked over with me their experience along the Susquehanna. Joe could scarcely read or write when he lived in New York. He had a private teacher in Kirtland and obtained a fair education. While the temple was building, the workmen lived in temporary buildings. Prayer meetings were held mornings by the workmen for the success of the work, before beginning their labors. One day while I was at the flats, a meeting was held in which the spiritual wife doctrine was discussed. Rigdon said if he had got to go into it, he might as well begin. He put Emma, Joe Smith's wife, on the bed and got on himself. Joe became angry. It was in everybody's mouth for miles about Kirtland. When I first saw Emma on the streets in Kirtland, she threw her arms around me and I think kissed me and inquired all about her father's family. I brought her letters and took some later to Mr. Hale from her. Joe told Emma he had a revelation about the plates, but that he could not obtain them until he had married her. I became acquainted with D.P. Hurlbut before he left the Mormons. He courted Dr. Williams' beautiful daughter and told her he had a revelation to marry her. She told him when she received a revelation they would be married. Everybody about Kirtland believed he had left the Mormons because she refused him. Other Mormons and Black Pete claimed to receive revelations to marry her. I was often in Hurlbut's company, and once while fishing with him on Lake Erie, after he had left the Mormons, he told me he was going to ferret out Mormonism and break it up. I replied you had better break up a nest of yellow jackets. I told him I knew the Mormons in New York State would as soon swear to a lie as to the truth. Later I told Hurlbut to write to Isaac Hale, Joe's father-in-law, and he did. Hale's reply is published in Howe's book on Mormonism. I heard Hurlbut lecture in the Presbyterian Church in Kirtland. He said he would, and he did prove that the Book of Mormon was founded on a fiction called Manuscript Found, written by Solomon Spaulding at Canute, Ohio, in the early part of the century. He said Spaulding was consumptive and could not work, and wrote stories to procure a living. He said he had seen Mrs. Spaulding, and she said a good share of the Book of Mormon was the same as Manuscript Found, which was written by her husband, Solomon Spaulding. Spaulding's brother asked him, as he was an educated man, why he wrote in old style. He said his title was Manuscript Found, and therefore he wrote it in old style. Hurlbut said Spaulding tried to obtain money to pay for printing it. While traveling he slept in the woods nights, took cold and finally died. Sidney Rigdon stole the copy left with the printer in Pittsburgh. Hurlbut had a copy of Spaulding's Manuscript Found with him. He and others spoke three hours. Hurlbut read Hale's letter in the lecture. Martin Harris said Hale was old and blind and not capable of writing it. I stated that Hale was called the greatest hunter on the Susquehanna, and two years before had killed a black deer and a white bear, which many hunters had tried to kill, also that he was intelligent and knew the scriptures. The night the meteors fell in 1833, the Mormons sent men on horseback for miles about Kirtland to arouse the people. They got me up at 3 o'clock a.m., they claimed it was the forerunner of some wonderful event, and it was said and believed. Prophet Joe said there would be no more stars seen in the heavens. All the time I was in Kirtland, many persons were becoming disgusted with Mormonism, and many left them and exposed their secrets. Squire J. C. Doan lived half a mile from me. He was physically and mentally a capable man. His reputation as a citizen was very good. This statement was read to me and my daughter before being signed. I heard Hurlbut lecture before, and after he saw Spaulding's widow, 